Come one, come all to the most wholesome rock and roll podcast in the land, The Highway with Kyle Shutt. I am Kyle Shutt, and I am so excited for this week's episode. I know I say that about every episode, but it's because I'm excited. This week, we've got Dave McLean. You might know him from Machine Head or Sacred Reich or even Essay Slayer. That's right. We're going to tell the Essay Slayer story. I am so happy. Dave and I got to share the stage with Metallica for a super long time on that tour, so we're going to go over some of those stories. We're just going to have a good old time taking a stroll down memory lane, talking about some Texas metal history. As always, if you like what you've been hearing on the program, go ahead and ring my bell. Go ahead and knock on my wood. You do whatever it takes to remember to (laughs) tune in every week. Oh, Lord, I'm getting canceled for this one, aren't I? If you want to go one step further and help keep these wheels a rolling, you can find us on patreon.com slash the highway for a few scant dollars a month. You can get early access to next week's episode. You can even help me put a six pack of beer in my fridge like John Moore did this week. Thank you so much, John. I'm about to add a lot more perks to the old Patreon page, like uh, get yourself some Kyle Shut merchandise if you want to wear me home or even get a monthly guitar lesson. So uh, everybody check out that page. we got a lot of fun stuff. We must also pay tribute to our almighty sponsor, Heil Sound. Because if you like the way I sound, it's because there's a Heil sitting right here in front of me. Now I can talk, talk, talk all day long. Don't believe me? I can prove it. Let's do things my way. The Highway. Brother, what's going on? Hey, man. Good to hear you. Long time no see. I know, man. It's been forever, but uh, I feel like once we start talking about the good old days, it's going to feel like yesterday. <laughs> so, <laughs> totally. So so you said you're in Wisconsin now? Yeah. We, uh, we, we bought a house here about five years ago just to come, just to come visit. You know, I got, uh-huh. I've got step, step family here and, um, it's like my, my dad and my stepmom. Like I grew up in San Antonio, but they, so they moved up here like back in probably like 80, 87 or something, 86. Oh, wow. And, um, yes, yeah, so we just bought a house. We were like coming up every, like every couple, like a couple weeks, you know, once a year, twice a year. And then, um, then we just decided like when COVID and everything, man, we're, we're renting in California. We got a house that's paid for, and even though it's in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, but it's, <laughs> it's cool nonetheless. Like we got it all, all dialed in. I got a, I got a drum room here now, and a garage, and it's killer. Awesome, so, man. Uh, dude, yeah. yeah I was uh, speaking of San Antonio. I kind of wanted to, uh, to dial it all the way back. I usually ask um, our guests, you know, sort of how they got into music. And uh, just what made them want to get in a van and just uh, give the world two middle fingers. But uh, nice. with, with you specifically, uh, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, shining some light on the subject, you're you're sort of part of this um, Texas metal urban legend. And, and uh, if if, um, if no one out there knows uh, the this, I, I'm going to tell the legend, and then I would love if you could tell the real story because the the way the legend goes is that there were in the '80s there were two bands called Slayer, right. <laughs> and that the the agreement was that there would be a battle of the bands and then whichever band uh won that battle got to keep the name slayer and the other one either had to change their name to la slayer or sa slayer and the way the legend goes is that the the slayer that we all know and love won and then uh your band because because you were in this band uh had to change the name to sa slayer now like i said this is all before the internet and this is like rumors passed down through um, you know, metalhead generations and stuff. But uh, whenever I moved to Austin uh, in 2000, I was uh, digging through the crates at a record store called Sound Exchange, and uh, I found mm-hmm. an SA Slayer record. And I was like, "Oh shit, it's true!" Or, or maybe at least part of it's true, or something. <laughs> but uh, it wasn't until uh, you and I, or uh, I suppose uh, Machine Head and the Sword, uh, were opening for Metallica on the Death Magnetic tour. Uh, you and I were talking backstage one day, and um, you mentioned that you we're in SA Slayer and it blew my mind. And, uh, you, you kind of <laughs> told me the story back then, but if you wouldn't mind for our listeners, uh, uh, tell us like kind of, you know, what the musical landscape in San Antonio was like and what led to that band. And is there any truth to that story at all? Yeah. Well, I, I guess 
the story that you just told about the name is kind of like that scene and uh hopefully some of the listeners can go back to fast times ridgemont high when they were like oh, i heard did you hear about uh that that did you hear about that student pulling a knife on mr hand like oh no no he just called him an asshole <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so back oh my god I'm trying to think of the exact year that um so me me and my buddy don who who was a bass player in sa slayer we we started getting once like the new wave of british heavy metal stuff came out like we were we were in a band that was just we were playing like you know thin lizzy tunes original tunes like riot and you know judas priest stuff and then like once that stuff came out like iron maiden angel witch and all that we were like oh my god like we gotta like we've got to this is like almost like this is our calling you know this is like what we got to do so we uh there was and I, i'm kind of this part's even kind of fuzzy i know we put someone put out an ad i don't know if it was me or um the, a couple of the guitar players that we found but um just looking for for like-minded people you know in san antonio people who were into that kind of that kind of scene it was very very underground you know like you had to go um uh like in San Antonio is a record store called Hogwild. There were a couple places um, where you could just go and you could find like Iron Maiden records. You could find, you know, the Angel Witch patches or the records and all that stuff. So, um, yes, yeah, so we started, we started this band and at first, at first we were called, uh, we were called Dragon Slayer <laughs> for like, for probably like a week. And then um, we, oh, we that's, shortened. That's a great name. <laughs> yeah. It was a little like, it was a little too much, like, kind of like, uh, I don't know, just, uh, yeah, like, it was a cool name. Like, that would be great for, like, a, a, a metal band. Like, that would be awesome. But we were just like, all right, you know, Slayer it is. And, and, you know, at the time, we were just kind of like, we were still playing, you know, we are playing, like, Angel Witch tunes and Maiden songs and went through a couple singers. And, um and finally, we found our dude. There was this. There was this guy in this band called Crown. His name was Steve Cooper, and he was. He was kind of like a cross between, you know, between Halford and like King Diamond, you know. So we were just like, and so we we had to get this dude, and he was, he was a little older than us. I think probably like five years older. Which when you're like sixteen or right. fifteen, that's pretty old, you know. And um, so we. We we auditioned this guy. I remember we played um, we played a Judas Priest tune because off staying class we we uh, auditioned him with um, Savage by Judas Priest and um, he nailed it. And we got it. You know we got him in the band and we started we uh, we did this battle of the bands thing and that's kind of like where where the whole Prepare to Die EP thing started was uh, this guy Bob O'Neill owned a owned a studio in San Antonio. And um, he was starting his own little, kind of just like his own little label, you know, called Rainforest Records. And he, so he he uh, he brought us in. We recorded this. We recorded this EP, and uh, it was cool because he had like he had us. He had he was doing stuff with Watchtower from Austin. Love that band. Uh, yeah, and they were just insane. Like they were they were like they were Rush, but they were just like even like more just crazy just technical it was like dark too you know it was like like dark rush sort of thing totally yeah. and they used to rush tunes and it was just insane like oh my god like they sounded they sounded perfect like just the like the best musicians you know and uh and then he also had he also had um the butthole surfers and um and so we you know we did this ep and you know things were things were like Things were cool, man, for, you know, in, in San Antonio for us at the time. We'd, we'd do shows with Watchtower down in Austin. We'd go, we'd go down to Houston. We'd play with Hellstar and Watchtower and just kind of trade off shows between between the two bands and everything. So, um, and it was cool. We had, a, we had a killer following in San Antonio. And then the... Uh, we and we did, the, we did the second record, which is, was called Go For The Throat, because Bob, Bob was like... Look, either, either we can like, you know, 
take this money that we were going to record. I can put more money into prepare to die, like press more copies and, and do this other record. And, and it was starting to get like, you know, and you know, just with the, I don't call him the, the real Slayer or whatever. <laughs> LA Slayer. And we used to, you know, any magazine that, that, that we would come out in like a review for the EP, it was always like a, a double review of like, here's the, the LA Slayer and here's the SA Slayer. And it was kind of like the sting. And so, um, you know, during this time, um, we, me, me and Don, we became friends with, um, uh, Mark Reale from the band Riot. And who was who was like one of our like you know one of our favorite bands just like like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and all that stuff like Riot was right up there you know and um, we started he he was like right after uh, the Restless Breed record with Riot is when we we started hanging out with him he loved San Antonio he loved the whole like southwest kind of thing and and so he'd always he'd spend most of his time down in San Antonio so um we started jamming with him he's like hey i have i have some songs for the next riot record and um you know let's if you guys want to do like demo them with me so we went in and and like learned you know like five or six songs from the the record which was going to be born in america and um did the demos and all that stuff and, and it kind of like after born in america with riot came out that kind of uh riot was kind of it was kind of over and he was ready to he was ready to start another band so so he you know he wanted me and don and and steve the singer from slayer we started doing the stuff with him and it was kind of you know slayer was kind of had kind of run its course in a way. And so it was, it really wasn't like a, it really wasn't like a thing where, um, it was a battle for the name. It was just Slayer was coming through town on the hot. They were, they were on the haunting the chapel t- tour. And, um, and it just turned out, it was just a thing where like the, the guy putting on the show, I think it was like Omni productions or something at the time in San Antonio. Um, you know, he was like, oh, man, it'd be cool to do like a Slayer and Slayer show. And and so they, for whatever reason, they agreed to it. I think they they were just like, oh, we're just going to like crush these guys once and for all. And that, <laughs> that, that, you know, but they were super, they were really cool. And they were, and it was cool, man, seeing, because we were into it. We, it wasn't like we hated, we hated the other Slayer. Like we, we loved like haunting the chapel. We, I remember just like cruising around and our friend's car and just cranking it and like with the windows down and just, you know, we loved it. So, so playing with a, sh- playing a show with those dudes was killer. And, and, uh, it was funny cause they were like, they were touring. And I think, I think it was somebody, somebody in the band, maybe it was Tom had a, uh, like a red, it was like a red Trans Am with a trailer on it. Whoa. And they were touring and that's, so it was kind of cool. We went and saw him in Austin, and then we did the show with him the next day. And but we were, that was just kind of like we were. That was like our last show we were going to do, and we were just kind of like everybody was kind of going and and you know going their separate ways, pretty much with with uh, with SA Slayer. So um, that that would have been great though to like like who would have judged to see like who I know, kicked right? who. <laughs> like a panel there and like oh sorry they slayer you guys blew it i mean la slayer. I, I gotta say though that the legend isn't too far from the truth but yeah that, that thanks so much for uh telling that story man i just I, that kind of stuff fascinates me yeah it was it was definitely a cool time for sure like especially just being it like you know back then like being in san antonio was just like you know and and doing our thing and having it having it be like an actual thing like we felt we felt like we were kind of like on our way you know so yeah it was cool man that's wild so uh, yeah what did you do um in the in the meantime because um the, i think the first time i saw machine head i don't think you were with them yet because that would have been they were open for pantera and i think yeah, that, was that was on the uh the the great southern trend culture were you in the band by at that point yeah 
Oh, totally. Damn. Yeah. So I saw you when I was like 14. I thought I was going to fucking die <laughs> at that show because uh, I was like, I'm, you know, I'm hard. I'm going in the pit. I think I've told this story on the podcast before, but yeah, it was just, uh, I think it was, um, pump Jack, this super, uh, old metal band from uh, oh, West yeah, Texas. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. it was, I think it was cold chambers first tour. And then, uh, yeah, machine head right when the more things change came out and then Pantera on uh, great Southern Tranquil. That was just a great show, man. What was that tour? Like, Oh my God, it was it was insane. So like we, there it was just awesome. I like before that when I was in, um, before I joined Machine Head and I was in Sacred Reich. That was one of the tours we did. Like just us and Pantera when they were on the it was on the Vulgar, the Vulgar Display of Power tour, and like it was right, like they were already doing good, but that record was just like exploded when we went. We were out with them, man. It was just like. It was just crazy watching this whole – you're just watching the – like, I, I watched him every night, like, in, when I was in Sacred Reich and then, you know, over when we toured with him and, and when I was in Machine Head. Like, I watched him every night just because it, it was just it, – it was like one of those one of those bands that you're just watching and you just know that you're, you're watching, like, what is at the time, like, the best thing that's out. You know totally. what I mean? Like, just – all cylinders just firing everything is just clicking and, and, and you're just like there's you have e- never ever have a chance of like blowing them off the stage <laughs> <laughs> kind of do your thing but yeah that was uh that was something else tour that that whole tour with yeah cold chamber and, and us and them that was badass god because i was yeah like i said i was 14 uh, then and then yeah, flash forward like ten years, I'm like 24 years old on tour with literally like uh, a, a down was the band uh, that was on the Metallica tour right before you guys joined up too. So it was literally like being out with yeah, remember like Rex and Phil from Pantera, Pepper from Coc, fucking Kirk from Crowbar, Jimmy from I Hate God, and then you guys, you know, it was just like it was literally me being on tour with like all of my childhood heroes all at the same Such time. It blew my fucking mind. How uh, how young did I look? <laughs> <laughs> on that tour <laughs> oh dude you got you guys were so so uh just like going back before that that thing started like do you do you remember i mean i'm sure like when you guys played you guys played slims in san francisco oh yeah and uh it was the night that that we all went out to out to lars's house mm-hmm. yeah, cause, and, yeah, like, cause but, you and rob showed up yeah and I, I think that was it from the band right yeah yeah yeah, we were hanging, and then um, yeah, I remember watching you guys, and yeah, you guys look. You, I was like, oh man, like you guys were like these little like whippersnappers playing this fucking killer, this just this killer music that I was like, oh my god, like you know when you watch a band, and you're like, fuck, like <laughs> here, like here they come, you know what I mean, like uh, uh like almost like like when you're like, oh, you're yesterday's news now, like here comes this band, and um. And that was a killer show, like Slims completely sold out, and like it was so badass. Um, yeah, but going that was so killer, man. Going out to uh, out to Lars's house after that show, and just like, what were you guys thinking going out there? Because that must have been nuts. Like, yeah, I mean, we we had met Lars before, like we couldn't really believe it, you know, uh, at, at first. But then, you know, I think he came out to see us at Slims uh, before that one time. And uh, for whatever reason, I think we had like a really crazy drive. We couldn't like really hang out that night. But then um, the, the night that you're talking about, yeah, we had a little extra time. And he was just like, "Come on out to my house, you guys." And we're like, "Holy shit! What is you know? What are we?" <laughs> we're like, put his address into the GPS. We're like, "Oh, this feels weird." And uh, yeah, he lives in Tiburon, which is sort of like on the other side of the bay, um, yeah, overlooking it and everything. And yeah, his um, his basement is. I don't, I don't know. I, I hate to say it's what you'd think it would be like, but it's just like he just had the sickest party basement with like this rad oh, dude, fucking was... jukebox, like a giant um, neon rattlesnake on the wall from like the cover of the Black Album, and just like a full. But yeah. we drank like fucking two bottles of tequila and smoked all kind of weed, and just yeah, it was. <laughs> dude, it was it was so kid the jukebox like I never get that out of my mind because it had like bad. It had all of like, it had all like the the. It had like thin, li- it had everything that like I grew up on. I had like all the new wave of British heavy metal stuff, and it had like Thin Lizzy and just like Riot and like everything killer. And then we went before we all left. I think didn't we go? Did you guys come in his car too? And he was playing us some stuff from I think Death Magnetic. 
I, I can't remember, dude. I was really drunk that night. I totally passed yeah. out on the floor. Like, I, I, I remember we drove our van to his house. So, yeah, we didn't ride with him. Yeah. Oh, no, we didn't ride with him either. We, oh, okay. were, we were just in his, like, this car that was, like, insane. And then, like, just cranking up these tunes. And it was just, like, it's just, like, one of those surreal moments uh-huh. where you're just, what in the, like, what the fuck? But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, those were the good old days. But then, uh, I, th- I think actually now that I now that my memory is kind of jogging, I think you guys played two shows on that tour before because I remember it was Down did the first few months, and then uh, Lamb of God um, did a little stint. But Lamb of God wasn't allowed to play the two nights at the Forum in L.A. because I think it was like some kind of Christian organization owns the Forum, and word got around that Lamb of God used to be called Burn the Priest. And they just like weren't having that. So literally, Lamb of God was like banned from playing the forum. So I, didn't you guys get called in to do those two shows? Yeah, that's right. That, I was wondering when I saw those two dates, I was like, man, that's crazy. Like those those two dates, and then we started the whole thing next year. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. what it was. Lamb of God couldn't play, and um, and uh, yeah, so we got we got called on it, and that was just a trip, man. Like the starting of it all, and um, because we we had actually they had they had asked us. Which was so weird, which I was going to say when we were at Lars's house, like, you know, when, when you're like hanging out with other bands and you have that tour talk, like, mm-hmm. hey, man, together, like, yeah. And then nothing ever happens. Yeah. Um, so, like, I just remember Lars that night, we were all hanging around and then he was just like, hey, you guys, like, what do you think of this? Metallica, Machine Head and the sword. And it was just like, whoa, what? Like, and you you kind of knew like it wasn't that kind of tour talk where it was and then it all happened like i just thought that was i just thought that was so fucking cool man like the the bands that they took out with them were like because they could have done anything they wanted you know what they i mean they could have just not taken any bands out they, you know they could not band, and they could have like they could have just so, or said like yeah you, you guys yeah you guys can come along for like five dollars a night you yeah, know and, yeah totally like okay cool like we'll do it and then but yeah it was just like one of those things where it was just like it happened and it was crazy and yeah so that we had actually had to tell them before because we were going to do we were already uh we already had to stay in like like europe and then japan and australia we we were going to do with slipknot and um and we actually had to tell metallica no like i remember we had this meeting and we were Oh, man we were in spain or something we had this band meeting it was just like ah oh, man like we've got to tell metallica that we can't do this <laughs> and it, and it was just like oh my god it was like one of those moments where you're just like i don't know it was just crazy but they like they had, they ended up they respected it and they brought us back out so like yeah so that was cool like the the forum shows were the whole start and i don't even remember really like I don't even remember, like, I, I don't even think we, the two bands, us and you guys, even saw each other that night, or so I can't even remember. But it was a wild <laughs> night anyway. I mean, because, like, backstage at LA at a Metallica show is fucking nuts. Like, you know, Rick Rubin's yeah. in there just reeking of patchouli. Fucking Foo Fighters showed up. Goddamn. Totally. Green Day was Girl. there. Fucking Cat Von yeah. D. Goddamn. I mean, just the System of a Down showed up. It was, it was nuts back there, man. Yeah. It, it was so nuts. So it was just like this whole blur. And then. But yeah, I think and Guy then, Fieri was there. I'm, I'm not joking. I'm I'm pretty sure Guy uh, Fieri was back there. <laughs> yeah, it was like <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so nuts. Oh man, Metallica's a shit. I know. God, it's, it's, it's funny because like a lot of people out there, you'd be like, "Man, fuck Metallica." Be like, you know what? Fuck you. You know, there's yeah, like fuck- n- there's not a more generous band in showbiz than those guys. I'm, there's not. I've 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 met them. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. They took they took good such good care of all of us and like oh dude just like the catering alone was like insane and then just seeing just seeing how that band operates like like yeah somebody could you know somebody could easily just go oh well yeah because they're making fucking like a bazillion dollars every year but like those dudes it like really teaches you something to like how much they care just just the fact that they practice for like an hour and a half before they go on like yeah. like out new tunes and like i used to go 
I used to sneak down to the, or just go down to like where I could, you know, down by the, the, uh, I forgot what they called the, the, the jam, jam room. room. Yeah. What, what did they, cause they had a name. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, just hearing like what songs they were going to pull out that night, you know, mm. and that one that and it was like, like that's super cool. And just like, I don't know, man, just like, and they were personable. Like they, and they, that's like the one band pretty much that like when any of those dudes are around me, I, I just clam up. Like I remember when we were in a, when we were in Stockholm and remember we all went out to that, like, or like Metallica would just like, okay, tell like a restaurant bar, like, Hey, we're coming by, like just close up and we're going to come by and party. Yeah, totally. I think that's the night that, that James got, uh, oh food my God, that's what? right. Yeah. That's, that was, um, I've seen a couple of crazy nights when bands had to cancel enormous shows in front of people, but that one was, uh, that one was crazy. I remember cause it was two nights in Stockholm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we all went and, uh, Hetfield was sober at the time, but that doesn't mean that he didn't eat his weight in oysters. And, oh, uh, man. Yeah, I think he had a bad oyster. And then the next day we showed up to play our set. And, uh, 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 fuck, I, I can't remember the, the stage manager's name, but he was like, eh, not tonight, boys. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, Het's on the way to the hospital. He's got a blood infection. We're about to go on stage and announce that the show's canceled. There's like 14,000 people out there. Like, oh, dude, that was crazy. Oh, my God. I mean, the, I, I got to say, the, the Swedes took it rather well. Um, they did. But yeah, and then remember the um, the the next leg of the tour was like the German leg, but we started in Stockholm to do that makeup show, and to say yeah. to say sorry to the whole crowd, uh, Metallica made a free shirt for anyone that showed up, and on the back it had it said "Retching, Sick, and Destroy." Totally. <laughs> that was. <laughs> God, I should have gotten one of those. Why didn't I? Oh man. Oh. Uh... I was trying to remember what it said. I thought it said like "Ride the Oyster" or something like that. <laughs> it it might has... have. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that was so crazy. But that that night when uh when we were at that we were at that that restaurant bar or whatever hanging out, it was like I used to say the stupidest fucking things sometimes around those guys because like I would just get like this is weird because you're especially like Hetfield, like he's just got this presence where you're just like ah uh, like it's just insane and like I remember you were you were smoking weed with Kirk and and uh. And, and I remember I had, he, he looked down at my shoes and I had, I had had like Converse had made these shoes for me with like my stupid face on it and like had like a thing. And, <laughs> and, he, and he said, and, um, and I was like, oh yeah, they made them. I'm like, Hey, I'll, uh, I could, I could get in, you could get some shoes made, you know? And he, and I was just like, when I said it, it was like one of like, Oh my God. And he was like, he goes, ah, that's cool. He's like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I could get some shoes made. And I was like, oh, fuck, <laughs> like, like you idiot. You know, like <sighs> you just want to say the right thing at the right. Um, oh my god. Yeah, it was, it was, it was. I remember, I remember one time it was like after, it was after the whole, the whole cycle had ended. But we, we were doing like a few um, festivals that. Met- and one was Sonosphere over in um, in Finland. I remember walking into catering, and it was like pretty empty, and just Hetfield was sitting there eating. And I walk in, and he just goes, "Hey, Dave," and I was like, "Oh my god," you know, it's like, "Ah, oh, fuck." And the, and Ghost had just played, and they had on like their like their white outfit things, I think. And um, I'm like, "Man, did you see Ghost? They were badass." And I go, "That they, they had their they had their throwbacks on." <laughs> And he totally laughed. And I remember just like, 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 don't say any, anything else. Cause you're going to blow it. Just like fucking like leave the room. Like you did it. God. So I used to call it, um, cause uh, he, he is a very tall, very imposing individual. And, um, uh, they would come out anytime that we would play like a, a club show, like the, in between the, the, the arena shows because they used to let us just do whatever we wanted that was another very generous thing about them but uh it, like we'd have a bunch of friends in the dressing room and stuff and then hetfield would walk in and just you know be like hey boys what's up and just you know be sh- shaking hands talking for a little bit and then i would look over at my friends and they just looked like they'd seen a ghost <laughs> and i was like oh yeah i should have warned you he might show up I, I used to call it dropping a hetfield bomb on people like oh, man, oh that man. was totally rude of me man i, sh- I, I totally should have warned you about that i'm so sorry amazing impress your friends yeah yeah 
Oh, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask you guys. That's right, because you guys were doing you guys were doing all all off day shows, right? When you could. Yeah, I mean, there was, back in those days too. Is you know, if you if you're not, you know, playing, you're paying. And so uh, when you have a tour bus and that, those are, you know, fantastically expensive, a lot more expensive than you think they would be. Um, and, you know, we were paid very well. Don't get me wrong. But, um, yeah, we, we you know, uh, Metallica, they only play every other day, sometimes every three days, you know. So we um, with, when you have too much free time on your hands, you get into a little more trouble. So playing shows is uh, is my favorite thing in the world to do. So we played as many as we could. Uh, yeah. So you got that. Yeah. So you guys were doing like ever we do like the. But it wasn't like a, a week break in between like two weeks, right? So you guys were you guys would stay there and play and keep playing shows, right? At first, but then once it was like the European part, we would just like fly home every two weeks and then fly back every two weeks. That European uh, portion was crazy. Remember when we played um, the Fest Halle in um, God, I can't remember where it was in Germany, but um, it was like the the train station where Hitler used to like you know direct oh, yeah. the, the trains to to go to the different concentration camps and shit. I mean, just like the we would play these insanely historical venues. It was it was hard to um, get lost in a performance sometimes just because the energy of that whole room was just like uh, so haunting. Oh, dude! Oh, totally! Like the yeah, it was like the opposite of playing like because like in the states it was just like you were playing every every sports arena so like you M- just NBA arenas yeah 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 like you just go like find the practice court and like go like oh, i just want to shoot some baskets on like <laughs> you know whatever and then when you're in europe you're just like oh my god like the the history of everything yeah, is, we, is we, so- yeah. i remember we played the uh, the olympic um center in munich where like black september had like taken all those hostages back in the 70s and stuff. I mean, it was just like every venue had just some crazy history to it yeah yeah <laughs> I should have hung out with you guys way more on that because I, I was just I don't know what I was doing. But. <laughs> well, you, y'all had that cool little like uh, practice set up in y'all's dressing room. I remember with like the electronic drum kit and stuff. And sometimes we would come <laughs> in and like jam on cover songs. Remember that day Hetfield came in? Like he just like walked by and like oh, dude. saw the kit. He was like, "You mind if I play?" Because he's a sick drummer. If people don't know that, and uh, so just like hearing him play, I, I don't remember what y'all were playing, but like maybe some Guns N' Roses tune or something like that. He was just murdering the fucking electric kit. <laughs> Dude, he, he it was insane. They uh they started he uh he, he they started playing one of our song like he was on the drum kit and one of our songs Aesthetics of Hate and like he was playing the drums to it and I was like, "Oh my god." Like and he was he would go into like uh, I'm not going to say he played it better than me, but um <laughs> but, but he did the same fills. He would do my fills and I was like and I was just watching going, oh, my God, like, you know, it's just one of those surreal moments, like, where you're like, OK, like, not only like did James Hetfield, like, does he listen to you? Like, he also knows, like, your fills. And then he he came up and he jammed that song with us one night. Maybe it was that same night. I, I can't remember. But like, I just remember, like, most of the time I would just like it was so cool because, like, I don't know how you guys felt about playing like having that stage like if it was if it was tough but like to work but like because our guys would be like oh man it's we'd have we have to fucking work up there but but for me it was killer because like i look right behind me i've got like a whole a whole crowd like you know six feet below me just all there like watching so it just kind of gave me this killer energy but um I remember just playing and I remember looking up and on my, I feel my riser kind of shake and I look up and fucking head fields right there, just over me, like rocking out. And we're, we're jamming aesthetics of hate together. And it was just like, Holy fuck. Like, you know, so, so sick, man. I, I love that stage, but I mean, we played, we played over a hundred shows on it, but they, they offered us the, the first of three slot on that tour for as long as we wanted for a two and a half year tour. And we lasted about a year before we were like, guys, we got to go home. And they were laughing at us. They were like, we didn't think you'd last six months. Like, go home. <laughs> like, take a break. <laughs> like, people don't realize, like, how hard it is to keep up with a, uh, uh, an act like that, um, of that size. But, um, yeah, the, the stage was in the round. So it was really difficult to figure out, like, where to go because all the gear was up there, all the lights, all the cables and everything. And so, I mean, but we did play, like I said, over 100 shows on that stage and um, got to the point where we could work it really well. We got to be friends with the light guys and stuff, and they would put little X's of, of tape down where, like, you know, when, when you get to the double solo part of Iron Swan, make sure you're on this X and I'll put some little twinkles on you and just shit like that. We, we you know, really figured out how to work it. But um, 
That's it was cool. definitely like a, a, a it was like a like musical boot camp. I mean, like we learned how to be a really you know well oiled operation um, on that tour. Uh, it takes a lot of discipline to. It does. To, it takes a lot. Keep it up, yeah. Yeah, because it's a lot of like there. There's no. There's no yay yay us kind of thing. It's like you're you're doing everything you can. You got five songs to win to win those people over and and it's crazy to think that like you know it, just because you think it's Metallica but it's like that is a very diverse fan base, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like a lot of them most of them don't even get you know you got to get those people who like don't give a shit who you are and then you got to like kind of win them over the, as best you can. Yeah. And, and yeah, it, it's definitely, yeah, it's hard. It's, it's a hard thing to do. I remember like some the dudes would get frustrated. So just, you know, like, like, fuck man, it's just hard. You know, it's hard. Like we're working extra hard to get those people into it. And it's just like, it's hard. So yeah, you guys a whole year doing it, man. It was, that's killer. It was hey, nuts. what yeah. was, what it, Remember your, uh, what was your parting gift you guys got? Did you guys get like headphones? Oh, it was something. Yeah. It was like, um, yeah. Uh, whenever you leave a Metallica tour, they give you a parting gift, like, like true gentlemen. And, uh, yeah, we got these like, um, noise canceling, like Bose headphones. They were really nice headphones. <laughs> yeah. Cause we got the, we got like the Bose, like the dock thing. Oh, like iPod speakers. Uh, yeah. It was just like a thing where you just, you just, uh, plant your, your, ipod into it yeah. you know with the old old school jack and you just put it in there and like yeah that was so they're awesome man. what sweet guys giving you a gift. i know giving you a gift yeah yeah that was so i mean cool. we're so lucky because like i'm even then i feel like maybe we might have been some of the last bands to get to experience that kind of like just that, that them on their comeback you know what I mean? Those kinds of like huge arena shows all over the world. Mm-hmm. Like that. It just it just seems like it doesn't really like happen anymore, all that often. Yep. You know? Yeah, it, it was definitely like it, it felt. It definitely felt special, and it felt man. It was just like it, it was just like it was just fun because like we were. I know we were we were kind. We were pretty much like at the about at the end of our our tour cycle, I guess, because we had gone pretty heavy for like a year and a half or maybe even two years prior to that so it like felt it was like we were playing shows but at the same time it felt like this amazing vacation you Mm -hmm. know yeah and uh which so it was yeah it was cool yeah and it just things like that just don't don't happen anymore especially for for bands like that like we were saying before like where they just like they could have taken anybody but they take they chose us yeah yeah. Hey, what was your, um, like when you guys, I remember, <laughs> um, like in the beginning, it, I think it was like the, the Rosemont, like the one, the like Chicago area show. I remember, um, I was just remember like we, we used to have to wait for our merch guy to, to like, he would have to wait for Metallica for them to count out their merch and then they would get to him. And he would be, I remember coming back to the bus and he was like, fuck, man, this is fucked. He's like, he's like, we sold one shirt. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I have to wait like two hours after the show's done for them to like count their stuff out. And then he goes, and then they get to me and they're like, oh, here's your, you know, here's your 30 bucks. That was crazy. Merch was like, it was, um, it was different for us at the time because we, I mean, we've always taken our merch game real seriously, but I, I definitely remember um, having to price match them. And, you know, this is back in like 2008, you know, we sold our t-shirts for like 20 bucks or hoodies for 40, but with Metallica, we had to price match. So it was like $40 t-shirts and $80 hoodies. And I was, I just remember being like eight, who's going to pay $80 for a fucking yeah. sword hoodie. And then you would see some like 12 year old kid walking around with it where I'm like, I know your mom bought you that $80 hoodie right now. <laughs> and, um, our, yeah. our numbers were like, I just remember they weren't too different from our like club shows. It's just that we were selling half as much shit because the prices were twice as much. Yeah. Oh it's, man, it's a that's very strange strange game. It was weird too because Metallica like they don't just have like a merch table at a Metallica show. They have like multiple kiosks everywhere yeah. all over the arena. There's even some out in the parking lot too. You know, and so oh. like, but our shirts would only be available at like 3 of them. Or, or something <laughs> like that. You know, so it was it, you know, it was, 
I'm not complaining at all. It was a no way. It was just a rough game. Trying to sell yeah. your own shirt when you have 17 Metallica shirts next to it that have like each individual like city had its own shirt with like a custom pus head piece on it. I mean, this their, their shit was over the top rad. So like team colors for each each town. Uh-huh. Like yep. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was so cool, man. It was like doing that doing that tour was like like a real learning experience, you know, and how to like. I, don't know. I guess I guess just like when, when we take bands out, we would we kind of had like a whole different perspective. Not that we we could ever treat them like you know like like Metallica. It's like our catering. It's like here you go. Here's some spaghetti. Or here's you know? ten bucks. Or, Fuck off. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rather than like oh here's like oh man just the whole spread at those things was was just insane. Like I got I, I was so spoiled. Like I got sick of prime rib on that tour. I was like <laughs> enough. Enough of this delicious steak. <laughs> Prime rib again? Come yeah, on, you We're guys. so spoiled. I, You know, it's a, and I'm super grateful to have done that, and it definitely felt like the top of the mountain because after that, it's, you know, we, we, we've we had a fine time going back to clubs and, and you know, s- smaller theaters and just having a great time, opening for other bands like, you know, Opeth or, um, it's just slipping my mind right now, all the other ones, but um, it, it just, that'll always be that, like, pinnacle for me where yeah. you know it's just it'll you know probably never experience anything crazy like that ever again but that's okay yeah. and even like, then you know going into the our band's hiatus and like kind of stopping playing shows and stuff it's hard on your psyche once you've just been foot to gas for that long you know what i mean what uh i, I wanted to ask if you don't mind uh what was it like uh kind of stepping away from machine head and, and just uh, having your life slow down a little bit did it did it kind of rock your world or do you think you were ready for it um I mean, I kind of got right back into everything when I, when I, when I left, you know, like getting back, going back to my old band, Sacred Reich. Uh-huh. And like, it was pretty much like pretty, pretty seamless just doing like leaving. And then I had like, you know, December off. And then like I was heading, heading over to, um, to Phoenix to start the rehearsing and then doing the record and then getting back out on tour. And, um, so yeah, it wasn't like, it wasn't much of a break now. Now it's been like, you know, the last year and a half has been yeah, oof, like awesome. Just like, I've loved it. Just hanging at home and, you know, now like having my drum room here in the garage, it's crazy. It's almost like, like I come out and I, you know, I practice like three, four hours a day and then so it's like I'm I'm back on tour, but then I can just come back home. I can come, you know, go to your door. <laughs> That's rad that you still play that often every day. Because I've um uh, I I've, I've taught some guitar lessons. I've talked to people that are getting into it, and they're like, "Yeah, I've been playing for like you know twenty thirty minutes a day." Like really, I was like, "You gotta play way more than that." <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get to the level that you want to get at, you know, so that's that's sick that you still practice that much. Yeah, just man, I like just I'm I'm turned into like a super I don't know just a super geek about learning things now and and uh, I don't know like just I don't know man like learning technique and mechanics and all that stuff like I could I could do it all day you know and it's just like. So it's cool. I've got my my setup. I've got like everything mic'd up and re- recording. So I'll record some things here and there. Do like, you know, Sacred Rex doing demo stuff. I can just just knock it out here, and it's cool. So yeah, it's pretty awesome. That's rad, man. Do you? Um, I always ask our musical guests uh, if they have any uh, songs they'd like us to play or anything like that. Do you have anything uh, new cooking up that might be coming out soon, or uh, do you have any songs you'd like to uh, to play for anybody? Um, man, we, we've got, we've got, we're working on a new, a new Sacred Reich album. Probably, we probably now won't get, get around to doing it till next year. Man, any songs? That's, that's too hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick an S.A. Slayer song so that, uh, yeah, yeah, for, do the, yeah. For those that uh, haven't, uh, had the pleasure, they'll, uh, yeah, yeah. They'll be able to hear hey, it. Um, you can play, uh, I mean, Prepare to Die, that was like, the first song on the first EP, so that's a good one. Absolutely, Hell yeah, man. dude. Those were like good old days, like we making that all that stuff, like the cover for that record and everything. Like we we found like this whole like like 
like we weren't like into Satan or anything, you know, but we like found this book that had all like the Satan things in it. And I had like this, like off this round, it was like a door and it had like this round, these round, this round thing with all the satanic symbols in it. So we actually like, um, Bob, the guy who had the studio, like when we went out and we like found this door and we painted those satanic symbols on it. And then we got like a, like a goat or a ram skull, and then we poured blood through the back of it, through a hole in the door, and that was like the cup. <laughs> That's so sick. <laughs> oh like before Photoshop or before like any kind of like, you had to do it yourself. It was cool. Absolutely. I mean, that's a that's a rad story. Well, shit, Dave, dude, thanks so much for coming on and like just hashing up the old times and just, God, dude, that, those were some really fantastic days. Do they were I, I I actually um not to keep rambling or anything but it was funny because like I, I I looked up I looked up all the dates so like because I was trying to like you know when you're going back in your in time in your mind and you can't sometimes you think the things that happened didn't really happen or like the time frame so like I looked up all the dates and man everything just kind of flashed back and I could I remember every single day on that thing and I just remember seeing all the dates and like all these memories floating in and, yeah. It was great, man. Well, thanks again, dude. And uh, yeah, hopefully mm-hmm. we'll cross paths on tour pretty soon because the the swords we're kind of gearing up to hit the road pretty seriously again. And uh, and and if y'all have a new record coming out, I know we're going to be playing some kind of crazy festival somewhere. Yeah, uh, we, we got to link up and uh, drink some more red wine and vodka. Oh, dude, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I miss you guys, and it'll be great to great to hang out again. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again. I'll I'll talk to you soon, buddy. Cool. All right.
much for tuning into the highway this week a big shout out to reverend guitars rail hammer pickups and earthquaker devices if you liked what you heard you can follow where you can follow subscribe where you can subscribe and if you want to go one step further you can support us on patreon at the highway with kyle shut for a few bucks a month you can help us keep this party going get early access to next week's episode and even get yourself a shout out <laughs>